Hello and welcome to Chinivision. This time, another portable Amstrad. Now you'll remember a while back we reviewed the Amstrad NC100 and in fact here is the very machine. Um, you can check the review of that out. Uh, it's in the description below. You can link through to that. But this machine came out in 1992 and some people said it's superficially a clone of the Cambridge Computer Z88. But this ignores the fact for many years Japanese manufacturers have been churning out computers like this which often made their way into the UK via Tandy, Rebadge Radio Shack, but often actually were made by people like Citizen. Um, this original NC100 from 1992 has 64K of RAM and an 80 column display with 8 rows. Um, the keyboard's really, really nice. Um, it's absolutely fantastic and Superb battery life, 20 hours on just four AA cells, which is excellent for the era, especially if you had things like Game Gears and Game Boys, and well, not so much the Game Boy, in fact, but the Atari Lynx. Uh, but the device's Achilles heel is the storage, because the only way to get stuff on is via the RS-232 interface there, or the PCMCIA slot there. Um, uh, now, any Amiga 600 or 1200 owner will tell you that these cards were very expensive back in 92, 93. Um, and although, you know, the Amigas had slots that could read these cards, PCs didn't, and only high-end laptops had the ability to read that storage medium. So that kind of rather undid all of Amstrad's good work with the long battery life, the good quality keyboard, and the, a standard printer interface on the back. Because if you can't get your data on and off easily... Um, I know techies will say, well, you could use the RS-232 serial interface. Yeah, but we're talking about average Joe who wants to be able to plug in a floppy disk and doesn't have access to PCM CIA card interfaces. So, um, Amstrad came out with the Amstrad NC200. And here it is. Uh, I've been looking for one of these on eBay for ages. Never been able to get one for a sensible price until now. Comes in a leather case or leatherette style case like the nc100 did this one's not quite as good condition as my nc100 case but let's open it up and take a look at it so here we have the nc200 still user-friendly amstrad like that a uh, user-friendly logo we'll open it up in a second but we'll have a quick look around at it what it's closed because you'll see it's a clamshell design. This all flips out. So you've got a PCMCIA slot there, same as the NC100. But you've got this very um, unusual floppy disk here because, look, the eject button is there. And it's so it, it's not very tall at all. It's, it's not like a normal full height 3.5-inch drive. I'm sure I've got some uh, miniaturized 3.5-inch uh, drive in there. Around the back, we have a power adapter. It's 7.5 volts center negative very important that a parallel port and a serial port there and speaking of power supplies here it is seven and a half volts uh, one amp linear power supply amstrad made in china um i'm sure this i i always get a bit jumpy about amstrad supplies after the gx4000 fiasco um because of the age i would always consider using a modern supply because you know it's 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 old and <laughs> it's linear, so um, I, I'm guessing there's not a lot of protection in there if that does go wrong for the NC200. So, what's different about the NC200? Well, it's a clamshell, so uh, you, I've already unhooked the switch there because otherwise I'd have to lift it up very slightly. It's just a plastic switch that holds it shut. Um, potentially could get brittle with age. Um, worth keeping an eye on that. But we open it up, and this is the big difference. There you go. It's it's more of a kind of not a laptop computer, but it's more in that kind of style. You can see this one's had a little bit more usage than my rather better condition NC100. But these are harder to get hold of, so you're not going to necessarily have the kind of choice you do where there are lots of NC100s on eBay and not very many NC200s. So this was released in late 1993. It is larger, as you can see, and it's got a floppy drive. So yes, it is far more power hungry and it has a clamshaft style case and a larger 80 column which is the same as the nc200 but it's now got 16 lines 
on there, which is twice the amount of the NC100. Uh, it does have a backlight, which we'll look at in a minute, makes working in darker conditions possible. And RAM is doubled for a measly 64K uh, to a more kind of slightly less pathetic 128K. Amsterdam being very stingy there. This is 1993, not 1985. And Scion, I think we're doing, we're Scion doing a minimum of 256K with the 3A around this time. Um, all this extra size is to accommodate the MS-DOS floppy that we saw, which is included in the case. And the battery compartment we'll look at in a second has gone from 4 AAs to 5 C cells. Still, you know, could be worse because the Amstrad PPC range uses 10 C cells. Um, and as PPC owners will tell you, floppy drives are battery hungry. They eat through them. So I, I read from multiple sources that the drive can only be used at near full capacity and the batteries will only last a few hours if the disk drive is used just a little bit. So we're going to have a test of this now to see how true this is. So this is the underside of the beast. Um, tells you what the voltages are and only use the adapter model number NC200. Yeah, uh, get something a bit better than that. Copyright 1993, made in Japan because these were made by, I think, Citizen. Um, Amstrad didn't outsource this themselves to Orion. Um, instead, they went to a company who already made these types of computers and said, right, this is what we want it to look like. This is what we want the firmware to be. Let's let's kind of get you to produce this um, using all your technology to get these kind of computers working. I assume Sugar had seen these kind of machines in operation in Japan as he usually had and thought, hmm, have a bit of that action. So we have this little slot there, which I'm not going to open up, but inside there is a ROM, um, which allows you to upgrade it if there was ever any ROM upgrades for this. I don't think there was. Lithium battery goes in there. Um, I've already done that. And here is where the C cells go. I haven't tried this out. This is going to work. Um, oh, yeah, foam's gone to, as it always does. But there's five, not six, just five there. Um, so you've got this weird arrangement of four there and one little one on its own. And I've bought some batteries. Not quite as dramatic as when I had to buy 10 for the PPC, if you've ever seen that review, um, the battery test on that. C cells. Don't see these very much anymore, do you? They still sell them. There must be lots of things using them. But uh, let's pop these in and uh, see how it works. There we go. Five C cells in the battery compartment. Nice. Let's shut this up. Oh, I've got my fingers on the gunk. Need to do something about that. Um, right. Close her up. Flip her over. So, same keyboard setup as the NC100 with these color buttons. You press the buttons to go Word, Calc, Diary, or Spread, or Spreadsheet. And there's some other shortcuts up there. But let's turn it on and see what happens. Yay! We are on. Apparently, it's Tuesday, 20th of March, um, which it isn't. Um, time is vaguely right, about 20 minutes out. I haven't set this up. I think this only had the lithium battery in it when I got it. Um, I wonder if someone's already been at this. Um, but let's get you down so you can see the screen. So I brought you down low so you can see the screen and the keyboard. I've got a little fader there that adjusts the brightness of the screen. The backlight times out after about 30 seconds. Um, so if you're reading something and you haven't pressed the keys, it goes off. Um, there might be a way to adjust that. Um, I'll get you closer in on the screen in a minute, but just look at the other things. I've got a little speaker there. Few scratches on this unit. Um, as I say, it's not the. These are rarer. You're not going to have a chance to be quite as fussy as you can trying to get pristine NC100s because they sold in far larger quantities. Um, and what I'm going to do, I think, first of all, is use a floppy disk and format one of those. So here's a disk. Um, take the right protect tab off. It's just a Amiga disk I have lying around that. Um, I had a PGA Golf Tour on it, which I don't need. Um, it goes there. It feels a quality mechanism there. And as you can see, look, the screen's gone to sleep there. Press shift. It comes back. Right. So you'd think, and this has gone to sleep again. There we go. You'd better format the floppy drive from the main menu. Yeah. Don't know what else I was thinking. But anyway, apparently, according to the manual, 
uh, which I'm not going to show here, but it's pretty much the same as the NC100 manual, which I covered extensively in the original NC100 video link below. And this manual just has a few extra things about floppy disks and things like that. So apparently now I have to press list do store documents green. And uh, that's the ones in memory. Right, so now I have to press, and I have to edit it there, because the, the version I've got here, I do have the manual, but I'm looking at it on an iPhone. The characters are messed up, so I have to press menu. And then I have to scroll down to formatting and export functions, and format, memory card format disk. Right, okay, format disk. And I'm going to bring you in closer to the screen so you can see it. Right, I think that's as good as we're going to get. Although it's not as bad as some of those other screens I've had to shoot for Chini Vision. Um, so we go to ludicrousness of this, shooting this in 4K. Um, anyway, so format disk. Do you want to format the disk? Yes, I do. It's making noises. That's, a, that's nice floppy disk sounds. You can always hear, hear the difference between a cheap floppy disk um, Atari and a good quality uh, floppy disk. And this one sounds pretty good to me. So here we go. Track 80. So we should be formatted. Does all that business it has to do around track 80. And I know I said I hadn't seen many drives like this earlier, but in fact, of course, laptops would have them in them, wouldn't they? Um, it's a standard laptop drive so right the disc is formatted and ready for use press stop to exit stop there we go right um and we can go up to the word processor now and go start a new document red uh, red chini Hello, this, I can't, I'm really at an odd angle over here, is Chenny. This is, of course, Protext, as originally came out on the Amstrad CPC. Um, odd, they didn't go for loco script from the Amstrad PCW on here, but it may have been that they, loco script's a much bigger package, um, much more fully featured, and it would require far more RAM. Whereas Protex will run in 64K of RAM. Um, and the idea is, of course, you put the external storage on the side in PCMCIA or you add a floppy disk. So how do we save this? We go to, we go to menu. Right, okay. So I've read how to get in there. So we go into list or documents. And then we go to the file we want, which is in memory. There. We then press the space bar, and we've selected that file. Now press the menu key, and we scroll down, and we go copy mark files to disk. Are you sure you want to copy the mark files to disk? Yes. There we go. Now, I, I've got some criticism of this, having just been through it. For a machine that is so well designed, to use if you're storing it locally um that's a bit of a faff to get the stuff on the disk why can't you just from the word processor copy it straight to disk as opposed to having this whole whole transfer thing it seems like an extra few steps that don't need to be there and i think that's because the floppy disk on here is an afterthought it's you're supposed to do all the work on here save it to the local memory and then transfer it to disk afterwards very much like you transfer it via the serial interface um not 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 so good really when this device is supposed to be so easy to use press function b and bbc basic is there cover this on the nc100 video um it's bbc basic without the graphics facilities basically um a great way to have portable bbc basic with you on a machine like this so you can type things in you can type programs in if you need that, a bit dated today, but very useful back in 1993. So you've got other software on here as well. You've got a spreadsheet, um, so you can start a new spreadsheet like that. Um, just by pressing the function and 
the white key. And it's a fairly funny, I mean, by modern standards, yes, it's dated. For the time, it's a fully functional spreadsheet. And of course, you've got a much larger screen as well, which um, makes it easier to use because you can get more cells on the screen. That's what it's all about, really, when you're doing a spreadsheet. They're trying to use it on a display half the size, like the NC100. It was a little bit difficult, but on here, it's far more usable. You've got a calculator. Um, you press the key. I mean, why you'd want to use this thing as a calculator, but it's there. Um, you use these keys as opposed to the keys along the top, except for seven, eight, nine, and uh, not even zero, actually, because zero starts down there. The idea is to give you a numeric uh, keypad, but um, yeah, it works. It's fine. Um, conventional calculator would probably be easier, but it's there if you need it. Um, you also have the diary function there, so you can uh, an address book and a calendar and diary and a time manager as well. Um, so you go in there and you can set alarms and you can do time zones and things like that. Um, it's all the basic stuff you'd need if you're on the move really for business. Another program on here you have to dig down into the manual to find is a terminal program. So you press function, you press S and we've got NC200 notebook serial terminal program. Just menu for terminal options. And there you go. This could be incredibly useful because it's got RS232 on here. So you've actually got a standard serial interface with a terminal program. You could connect to anything you need to. Say you were maintaining machines in the field. Um, ISDN units back in the day, the audio codecs, used to have, well, some of them, um, used to have serial interfaces on the back. And you could dial in with one of these in a data center or somewhere running off of batteries and get in and adjust the codec to your requirements. Anything with a serial interface, really, this thing could be really useful. Labs, electronics places, um, as a cheap alternative to a PC that just runs off batteries and has a terminal built in. I'm surprised Amstrad didn't shout about this more as a feature, really, because I think it's really, really good thing to have. So another thing this thing has that the NC100 doesn't is games. So you press yellow and G, and we got three games, Blockade, Super Blockade, and Tricade, a lot, of, a lot of aid going on here. I'm thinking Tetris, oh, here we go, it's gone off on its own. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a, a track mode. Am I playing? I'm not playing, am I? Hello, what's the controls? Certainly space, it's a Tetris clone. Oh, there we Oh, I see I've got the keys wrong, right. That music could get irritating quickly. There is no volume control, of course. <laughs> Imagine being on a train. On a quick game of blockade. And this thing starts up. There's got to be a control to turn the sound off. No, I, th I thought S might do it, but no. So let's go back in. Uh, yellow and G. Red to press blockade. Okay, let's try again. And down we go. Oh, right, okay. Unlike Tetris, where you press the down key, it accelerates it down for the amount of time you're holding down the key. It On this, it accelerates it until it hits the bottom. <laughs> no one. Did no one think. There must be a volume control on this thing, please. Once I've played this game, which I'm going to lose. But that <laughs> This isn't very good. <laughs> Just... I mean, look at it. It's ridiculous. I mean, what the... Okay, oh, right. Okay, we've got, oh, we've got sound toggle there. Oh, phew. Um, uh, we've got some, all this wasted space. <laughs> Just, if you're going to do a game, if you're going to program a game, right? I'm sorry. If you're going to program a game, for a display that's really wide and not very tall, why, why on earth would you do Tetris? <laughs> Just, what do they... Amstrad City in Brentwood going, oh, yeah, no, no, Tetris. We put Tetris on the display. If it was tall and wide at all, it would work brilliantly. But the gameplay area is the most absurd thing I've seen in 30 more 34 35 years 
of playing computer games. Even, oh, some of those ports on some of the 8 bits, we got tiny windows or or Doom, it's gone to Steve on the VIC 20 with its tiny display. And you think, oh, that's kind of cool because it's on a Doom running on a VIC 20. This is just, we're having Tetris no matter what. We're going to put it in <laughs> to hell with everyone. And I love the way when it's game over, it briefly flashes up with the system menu <laughs> and then flips back into the game. Oh, what am I playing now? I'm playing Tricade. What's Tricade? It's it's the same game, but you have triangles to play Super Blockade. Press green to play Super Blockade. What's the difference between Super Blockade? It's got a different tune. No. <laughs> Just, I can't believe that anyone sat down and went, yeah, this works. This is absolutely fine. Come up with another puzzle game that works on a really wide screen and make it fill the display. Not the high scores all over there, all this stuff there. Controls on screen, fair enough. That helps you score, fair enough. But there's so much wasted space. The high scores alone take up about the same amount of screen, screen space as does the logo. It's like the last V8 in terms of wasted screen space, but worse. Um... I don't see what super blockade is. Presumably, it looks like it's got more patterns there. Yeah, this is this is tat. Dear me, no, 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 no. There's no. Yeah, program yourself something better in BBC Basic, basically. Um, out we go. Right, so that's a look at the NC100. What I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this running uh, once the video's finished, and in the edit, I will put on the screen how long roughly it ran for. Um, with me accessing the floppy disk every 10 minutes or so um, and trying to keep the backlight on as well. And we'll just see if it does better than that reported two hours if you're accessing the floppy disk. Um, it's a quite a nice device. Um, I know I criticised it in the review for the way you access the floppy, but thinking about it, I think Amstrad, that there's reasoning in Amstrad's logic because if the floppy disk does hammer the batteries um, as suggested, then you don't want the user easily accessing that drive to save everything on there every time they print something. What you want them to do is actually store everything in the memory on the flash storage, either PCMIA or the flash storage inside here. And then, actually it's not flash, is it? It's just standard RAM. But that point aside, what you want them doing is storing it on there and then only transferring it off when they need to, to conserve that battery life. Because if you're hitting save every few minutes, typing a document, that battery is going to get absolutely hammered. If you're saving it to memory, that's using hardly any battery at all. So I think that's why they've done it. I really like all the little hidden features in here. Um, things like the BBC Basic, um, which you go into, which, okay, it's all in the manual, but they've tried to make it as easy as possible from this display here and then actually hidden away the more advanced features like the terminal program which i think is incredibly useful wow i just i'm going to end up using this thing as a terminal i expect because actually it's going to be far easier than anything else because at the moment i boot up a windows um xp box to use terminal and with a standard serial interface i could just use this Stick everything onto floppy. Okay, it's still got to go through my Windows XP box. But that would be so, so easy. So I can, I bought this thing just for a review, not thinking I had any need for it. But actually, wow, yes. Um, in 2018, if you want a terminal a box just for that kind of RS-232 access of things, then this thing's absolutely stunning. Um, I can't think of many other devices. Okay, the NC100, I think, also has this built in, but it doesn't have floppy, so it's immediately it's useless to me. Um, I can get stuff on and off via a relatively modern computer. Okay, an early 2000s Windows, Windows XP box. Um, and it's 720K, obviously, so you've got to make sure, again, you have support for that on your micro. But, no, that's really good. The word processor is Protex, so it's solid gold. It's not advanced, doesn't have all the advanced features of the later word processors, but good enough to type stuff on. Um, 
And again, you can get stuff on and off easily. It's a shame this machine didn't sell in huge quantities, really, because I think it's a really decent little device. And I suspect the reason it didn't sell in huge quantities was because at this time in 93, okay, laptops were incredibly expensive, but um, they were more attractive because you could run Windows on them and run everything on them. So people who were executives who were on the move looked at this and went, ah, old tech, we don't care about that. Well, someone else is paying for it. I'm going to have a brand new Toshiba laptop with the nipple thing in the middle of the keyboard and things like that. But of course, there's, there's one fly in the ointment here as well. There's another device that was out at the same time, smaller, about the same price, slightly longer, well, much longer battery life, in fact. Doesn't have a floppy drive, but it fits in your pocket. And it is the Scion Series 3. Yeah, the real problem with this, the NC200, is you could be having one of these for the same money. Okay, not one with two megabytes of RAM like this one, but unfortunately, the NC200 is Amstrad's take using their 1980s knowledge to make a portable, cheap computer. And that's fine. But the problem is, Scion are making something far better. Okay, it's got a tiny little keyboard, but this goes in your pocket. It goes in your pocket. It's absolutely wonderful little device, the 3A. Um, and I have one of these. And if you were asking me in 93, 94, what I wanted, well, Christmas 94, I got a 256K version of one of these. And I carried it around everywhere and used it for everything. Yes, the keyboard's tiny, but it's usable. Um, it's not big. It runs off just two AA batteries. No, it doesn't have the storage, the convenience of that floppy disk drive on the side. Um, and you had to use RS-232 and it was a pain getting stuff on and off. But you put that aside for the convenience of the size of this thing and just how good it was. So unfortunately, the problem with the NC200 is, I think, it's time to cast it before it was even released. And frankly, you could carry something better around in your pocket that was not that much bigger than the floppy disk drive you use in the NC200. So yes, it's much bigger than a Series 3A, about the same price. And when you consider that 3A is the same size, not much bigger than a floppy disk, um, that back in the day you would have chosen a 3A. But today, what's an NC200 useful for? Well, the fact it does have a floppy disk, which can sometimes be easier to get stuff on and off with, but that terminal program, um, I could see that being really useful for all sorts of uses here for my retro gear. Oddly enough, because the machine's behind the times, it's still incredibly useful.